Hello everyone, welcome back to Music Appreciation. Looking forward, today we're going to talk about discovering new soundscapes in a multicultural society. And we're also going to talk about anthropologists, ethnomusicologists, and empathy. Our central question for today is, how do we know about the musics of cultures outside of our own? Beginning discussion real quick, I want you to think about something. So take a few seconds before you really come up with an answer here. You can pause the video if you want and think. But how do you think your personal taste in music developed? Take a few seconds to think about that. How do you think your personal musical taste developed? Okay, so what do you think? How do you believe your personal taste in music developed? I'm going to link a video here for you to watch. And it actually shows scientifically why we think certain kinds of music are better than others. So go, go take a look at that video real quick. So that video actually shows scientifically that you're more prone to like the music that you listen to as a teenager, but also what your parents listen to as teenagers, because generally if you like the music you liked when you were a teenager, then that's what you're going to listen to growing up. Because when you're growing up, you don't always choose the music you listen to. You just listen to whatever your parents have on. It's like taking me, for example, again, the reason I like rock music so much is because my mom really likes rock music. And when she was a teenager, she went to a whole bunch of concerts for different rock musicians that were coming in and touring. So when I was growing up, whenever she would want to listen to music, that's the music she would play for us. Same thing with my dad. He listened to a lot of country music. So when I was growing up, I would listen to country music with my dad. And that's why now that I'm grown up, I like rock music and country music because that's what I grew up listening to because that's what my parents grew up listening to. So it's interesting to see that you can scientifically figure out why people like certain kinds of music because it's just a cultural thing. It's what you grew up with. So that's what you continue doing. Now, moving on from what we like and what we can scientifically track why we like something, what are ways that we can expand our musical taste to include different kinds of music? Different things you could do could be uh, getting a suggestion from a friend on some music to listen to. Uh, you could just flip on a random radio station and see after a while if you like any music from there. You could put YouTube or Spotify or something on shuffle and see what kind of music comes up. Y you can go to the top billboard charts and see what's there and go check some of that music out. There are a bunch of different ways that you can expand your musical taste and maybe include different kinds of music. Picking on myself again, I recently got into a musical called Hades Town because one of my friends messaged me one day telling me that I really needed to go listen to Hades Town. So I was like, well, okay, I'll go listen to that music. And I listened to the whole thing in one sitting and have kept listening to it since because I, I really like it. That expanded my musical taste. I didn't know that musical existed, but hey, I got a suggestion from a friend and now I really like that music. So there are many different ways that we can expand what music we listen to. Now, the music in other cultures is a bit different. So like we've talked about, American music is very diverse because immigrants from around the world brought their culture and their culture's music to America. So it became a part of the American culture, having all of these different arts, including music from all places around the world. So we are constantly exposed to the music of our multicultural society. We have genres like rhythm and blues and gospel and jazz that are in part derived from African-American culture. When you go to a Chinese restaurant or 
you see like Chinatown in a movie, you'll hear music in the background that is inspired by Chinese cultural music. Or when you go to a Mexican restaurant, you'll hear mariachi music or other kinds of Mexican inspired music. Or you'll hear Japanese music at a Japanese restaurant. You hear all of these different kinds of musics depending on where you go and what you're exposed to. And we're exposed to more music from other cultures than we usually think that we are just passively. And especially in things like media on TV or in movies, they'll take music from whatever culture that is being involved in the story and use that in the media so that you can be exposed to that sometimes without realizing that's what you're being exposed to. Before the phonograph was invented in 1877, there were no recordings of music to listen to. That picture in the bottom right, that is a phonograph. It's basically a very, very early version of a record player. But before that thing was invented, there was no way to record and listen to recorded music. If you wanted to hear music, you had to go to wherever it was being performed. So if you wanted to hear an opera, you had to go to the opera house. If you wanted to hear a musical, you had to go to the theater. If you wanted to hear a street performer, you had to go to the street they were performing. So you had to go wherever it was being performed. And that includes foreign music. If you lived in America and wanted to hear a European symphony play, you had to go to Europe to hear them. If you wanted to hear a traditional Japanese flute music, you would have to go to Japan and hear that. You had to travel to where the music was being performed. But now, because we have recorded music, we are exposed to all kinds of different music from around the world. All of these YouTube clips that I'm putting up for you to go listen to different cultures' music is a fantastic opportunity for us to be able to listen to things without having to go there. Now, regardless of the specific sound of the music or wherever it came from, we can still use the terms that we have talked about to describe that music. Things like timbre, rhythm, melody, harmony, mood, especially means expression order. You can still use every term we have talked about in this class to describe any music from any culture. So here, after this explanation, I want you to pause the video and go do this assignment. In Schoology, there is an assignment. It's labeled listening activity for you to do in the middle of the video. You're going to listen to this playlist of music from all kinds of places around the world. There'll be musical excerpts from Africa, Asia, Europe, Central America, North America. And I want you to try to rate how familiar you are with that kind of music on a scale from zero to three. So zero being you are absolutely not familiar with it whatsoever to three being, oh yeah, you're really familiar. You know that music. You don't have to listen to the whole song every time. You can listen to about 30 seconds of each one and be able to do this assignment. So I want you to pause the video and go do this assignment and then come back and we'll continue. Next, we're going to talk about who they are. So throughout history, people have created art. There's Ice Age cave paintings where not only do people have tools in these paintings, but they've decorated their tools. There's a sense of craftsmanship, but also design. So we can see through artifacts how people lived in thought and went about their lives through the art that they left behind. Because like we talked about before, the art of a culture radiates that culture. So if people created art, you can get a look into how they thought or the way they feel about things through the art that they leave behind. In Mesopotamia, in the ruins of ancient Babylon, archaeologists have found rattles and flutes and harps dating back 4,000 years. And uh, just a note that I've always thought about when it comes to this is that the Hanging Gardens of Babylon were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, supposed to be one of the most beautiful things on the entire planet. And 
if they took that much care of plants, I wonder like how their music was. If they took that much time to make this beautiful sprawling garden, I wonder what kind of time they put into their arts and the kind of music that they had to accompany that. That's just something that I've thought about that the, the art of a culture that we can't always see. So just as your musical preferences help define who you are, the music of other people and other cultures help define who they are. If they have instruments and music, just like we have music, then as far as them as people, they're not too different from us. Ancient, foreign, American people have dreams and ways of coping with struggles. They and we are sensitive and consider arts to be an important part of our lives. People have emotions no matter what culture you're from or when you lived. People have emotions and struggles and hardships and ways to get past that and cope with it. And just imagine the music of ancient people. What songs would they have sung when they were victorious in battle? Or if they were in love with someone, what kind of songs would they sing? We know that they made music because music is a universal phenomenon. But if we had a record of that, maybe it could help us understand them more. Unfortunately, we don't have that. But it's still interesting to see that we are still people, whether they're ancient people or modern people, they're still people people that have emotions and arts and using art to cope with everything that happens in life. A system for writing music wasn't developed, at least in Europe, until about the year 800. And recorded music is barely 100 years old. So in a lot of these cases, especially with ancient people, music was passed down by ear or some of their traditional teaching and was never written down. So as a result, we only have access to, d depending on what culture we're talking about, we only have access to about a thousand years worth of music, not the full 4,000 plus years that people have been making music. So it's very difficult to become familiar and really learn about the musics of cultures that either don't record their music or don't have a way or choose not to write down their music, where... If it's just passed down by ear constantly, it, it's hard to have a record of what they're doing in that culture as far as their art and especially in their music. However, we can become familiar with unwritten cultural traditions through examples of music recorded in the field. And what I mean by in the field is people going out and recording what these people do and learning about their culture so that the rest of us can also learn about that culture. And there are two specific kinds of people that do this. One is an anthropologist. An anthropologist is a scientist that studies the physical and cultural characteristics and social customs of a group of people. So what an anthropologist does is they'll go out and live and study with a culture that is foreign to them so that they can learn about this culture and really be in depth and engrossed in what this culture does and what they think and how they think and the customs that they have. And they can really learn about this culture that may not have a recorded history or may not have some form of permanent record. These anthropologists can go out and they can take a record so that people outside of that area can learn about them. And an ethnomusicologist is very similar. So an ethnomusicologist is a professional that studies the music of different cultural groups. Basically, they do the same thing. They'll go out and live and work with these people and they'll learn about their music and they'll record their music and they'll have a record of the culture of these people. And the these people go out and interact and live with these people so that they can learn firsthand about their culture. And the reason that they do this is so that people outside of that circle can learn about them. It's how we as people can learn about some small tribe in the middle of the Pacific Islands without having to go there. We can learn about all of these different cultures from around the world from a YouTube video. This is why anthropologists and ethnomusicologists are important because 
they can go out and do this learning and then they can put out this information so that everyone can learn about these groups of people. One of my college professors is an ethnomusicologist and he spent years going all kinds of different places around the world, living with people and learning about them and recording them and learning about their lives and their culture so that he could come back home and everyone else could learn about it. That's how I'm able to talk about, like we'll learn in the future, uh, we're going to talk about a small tribe from Cameroon and their music. Or we can talk about the music of Pacific Islanders and how their music interacts with their culture. These people are there so that we can learn about all these other cultures. I know these are giant words, but I want to break them down so that you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So a quick explanation of these actual words, because I know they're big words. So anthropologist, anthrope or anthropo, depending on the context, means people. And then an ologist is a person that studies something. So people and person that studies something, you put it together and you get anthropologist, a person that studies people. Then same thing for ethnomusicologist. So an ologist is a person that studies then music and ethno just means of another culture. So an ethnomusicologist is a person that studies the music of other cultures. So ethnomusicologist is a person that studies the music of other cultures. Just like an anthropologist is a person that studies people, an ethnomusicologist is a person that studies the music of other people. Next is developing empathy. So through familiarity with and understanding the music of different cultures comes empathy. Empathy is the ability to look at the world from another person's perspective. Music and other arts give us a first-hand glimpse into how people express themselves and communicate their feelings. So it invites us to get to know these people and be empathetic towards them, that we can see their culture and their art and their music, and we can understand what it's like to see the world from their point of view. Understanding the music of other cultures isn't always easy. If you think back to that, to the Japanese flute video in the listening activity, if you're not from traditional Japan and you're really familiar with that music, that music just kind of sounds like nonsense. So if we're more open to new music, it, like I said, meeting a stranger, it can be like making a new friend where you're unfamiliar at first, but then you came to understand and like them. This also goes back to that music not being a universal language thing because a lot of the music in that music from other cultures listening activity doesn't make a whole lot of sense usually unless you really know about that culture. So music is not a universal language. You can't listen to any music from around the world and understand everything about it. But music is a universal phenomenon because no matter who it is, every group of people ever has some form of music. Now, sometimes it takes understanding what music you're listening to to have a clearer understanding of what you're hearing. So sometimes we need to look at the kind of cultural background of a place before we can understand the music that its people put out. And so we can understand where they're coming from and have that empathetic, seeing the world from their point of view kind of view. So wrapping up, we learned about discovering new soundscapes in our multicultural society. And we also talked about anthropologists, ethnomusicologists, and empathy. Today, we're going to talk about the music of Cameroon and specifically the Bamalike warrior dance. Our central question for today is, what is one of the musics native to the people of Cameroon and what is its significance as a type of musical expression? So Cameroon is a republic in Western Central Africa. You see in the map in the bottom right, it's highlighted Cameroon so you can see where in Africa I'm talking about here. So there are more than 150 different ethnic groups within Cameroon. Cameroon comes from the Portuguese name for a river in the country. 
uh, I don't speak Portuguese, so I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but it translates to River of Prawns. And that is where the name for the country Cameroon came from. Cameroon is very geographically diverse. It lies on a volcanic belt, including Mount Cameroon, which is the highest mountain in West Africa. And there are hot, humid coastal plains that extend from the ocean. And then there are mountains that are some of the wettest places on Earth. The central Adamawa Plateau is relatively cool and it has a pleasant climate that doesn't change very much throughout the year. So there are many different areas for people to live in and people to have different cultures in in just Cameroon. In Cameroon, one of the cultural groups is the Bamileke people, which I put that pronunciation there to help me out as well. The Bamileke people. Bamileke is one of the tribes that are in Cameroon. It's not, the entire country is not these people. This is one tribe in Cameroon. And these people perform a kind of music called Lali. Lali is a warrior dance of the Bamileke people. And Lali has great rhythmic energy and subtlety. And centuries ago, these warrior dances served a preparatory as well as celebratory purpose. The male dances expressed bravery, virility, and brotherhood, and they celebrated prowess in battle, self-confidence, and manliness, and it was meant to pump up people before they went off to war. So I'm going to link this video. I want you guys to go watch it. Take notice of the instruments that are used, as well as the costumes that they're wearing and the dances that go along with the music. Some of them are even wearing certain kinds of instruments like around their legs. So I want you to go watch that video, pause this one, go watch that one, and we'll come back afterwards. The music itself came later on to serve a different purpose because from the 1400s to the 1900s, colonialism, which is forced control by a European country, stripped many African people of their independence as a country. So warrior dances were viewed by their colonial rulers as a symbol of self-assertion and insubordination. It became a metaphor for local pride and revolution. Uh, there was one anthropologist in the time that said throughout Africa, warrior dances were usually crushed and other dances that might loosen the colonial grip on their expression of communal life. The reason that colonials did this is because if you're trying to control a group of people, then you don't want them to be self-expressive. You don't want them to have a sense of unity as a people because you're trying to control them. And if they have a sense of unity, they might come together and rise up against you. And if you're trying to have control over a group of people, the last thing you want is for them to rise up and take control for themselves. So these warrior dances were used as a way of bringing a tribe together uh, before war or before battle or to celebrate a successful uh, campaign of some kind. But then it later became as a way to bring the community together because this was something of their culture that brought them together as a people and brought them to feel a sense of unity with each other. And the colonials didn't like that. So these expressions were very widely prohibited. Missionaries even feared going over to these people because of the sense of solidarity that these dances evoked. It brought people so close together and gave them such a sense of community unity that people didn't really want to mess with that unless they had to. Thankfully, nowadays, colonialism in Cameroon and most places around the world are now over. So today, those dances don't have the same banding together against an oppressor that it once had, but it still symbolizes tribal unity and pride. The Bamileke now present the Lali warrior dance as a musical performance instead of an expression of war. It is still a part of their culture, but now they can use it as expressing their culture instead of trying to band together against an oppressor. So the Lali dance was originally ceremonial, so performers wear all of those masks. If you look back in the video, there are ceremonial masks, and they have bells on their legs, and they have very elaborate clothing, and it is meant to be an exposition of their culture. It is meant to show off their culture and their unity as a people. So let's wrap this up today. 
We talked about the music of Cameroon and specifically the Bamileke warrior dance. Again, I'm not saying that the entire country of Cameroon is Bamileke people or does the Lali warrior dance. We were looking at a specific example of a group of people within Cameroon and how they use their music as people to express themselves. So make sure you go complete your Schoology assignment for today because it not only does it affect your grade, but I use it for attendance. So make sure you go ahead and complete that. If you have any questions, as always, please email me and I'll help however I can. Have a good day.